Well, hello. Welcome to Exploring the Quran and the Bible. My name is Gabriel Said Reynolds. This is a really super interesting episode with a famous particle physicist named Stephen Barr, who has also written extensively on faith and science or religion and science. We cover issues such as evolution. How can you square evolution with traditional accounts in the Bible and the Quran? with the history of humanity, also about the Big Bang, the relationship between time and space, whether the Big Bang vindicates the convictions of believers that the cosmos are created by an all-powerful God, and also um, more about how to think generally uh, about science and religion, whether they're in conflict or in harmony. So, hope you enjoy it. And while you're here, hey, I have an idea. Why not right now go ahead and subscribe to this channel? I'd be really grateful if you would do so and also spread the word to all of your friends and everyone else. Um, and please, when you get this episode going, go ahead and like the episode. That really helps uh, and just gives me reason to continue providing this sort of content. Thank you so much. Well, hello, Steve Barr. Very nice to see you uh, for this uh, episode. Well, thanks for having me on. It's great to have a chance to speak to a specialist on science and religion. Um, you know, this channel, Exploring the Quran and the Bible, has focused principally on questions of text, philology, understanding um, certain elements of the Quran and the Bible's narratives or theology. Uh, but uh, in this episode, we get a chance to speak uh, with you about uh, the scientific questions, which have some <laughs> sort of intersection with um, uh, let's say, traditional monotheistic views. So that's, yeah, I'm really, really grateful to have you with us. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read a short bio, if that's okay, um, mm -hmm. Steve, so people can get to know you. And then I'll ask a couple of questions, just general background about uh, your life and your work, so they can get to know you a bit further. Mm -hmm. So friends, um, Stephen M. Barr is president of the Society of Catholic Scientists and professor emeritus of theoretical particle physics at the University of Delaware. His research has centered mainly on grand unified theories and the cosmology of the early universe. In 2011, he was elected to be a fellow of the American Physical Society, quote, for his original contributions to grand unification, CP violation, and baryogenesis. Did I say that right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Good. He writes and lectures extensively on the relation of science and religion. He is the author of Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, that's with University of Notre Dame Press and was published in 2003. And for me, it was just an incredible read, just really eye-opening and uh, well-written to just a page turner, um, but also robust in uh, its uh, discussion of science and religion. It's also the author of The Believing Scientist, Essays on Science and Religion with Erdmans, published in 2016, which gives you a more up-to-date discussion of uh, scientific topics, which are you know, changing rapidly. And also, um, uh, Steve was elected in 2010 to the Academy of Catholic Theology and was awarded the Benemarenti Beni 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 right. Beni Marenti Medal by Pope Benedict XVI. So that's, uh, that's a wonderful honor. Well, can we just start with how you, uh, in, from the bio, there's a bit of background on the scientific work that you do, but how did you get involved in science and religion? Well, I've always, uh, since I was a, a kid, I've, I've always thought about these questions for my own benefit, you know, just my own curiosity. Uh, and so over the years, I, I've read a lot and thought a lot about science and the relation of science and religion. Uh, I got into actually writing about it somewhat serendipitously uh, and speaking about it. Um, I read a book in 1995 that I found that I thought was very important, and I uh, wrote a book review of it and sent it over the transom to <laughs> sent it to First Things and Magazine. And uh, much to my surprise, they 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 published it, and then they started sending me things to to write. Uh, I mean, uh, books to review, or right. if I wanted to write an article. So I got into writing about it, and one thing led to another. Um, so I spent more and more of my time on, on writing, speaking about science and faith. And, uh, so this wasn't your doctoral research. No, no, no. I mean, uh, up until Great that time. point, I, uh, I'm a physics guy and my life revolved mm -hmm. around physics research really, and some teaching, but mostly physics research. But, uh, but 
as I said, I've always thought about these questions. One thing that precipitated it, I think, I always thought that one day I would write a book because I was dissatisfied with a lot of what was out there. And uh, it sort of irked me that a lot of people out there were saying, you know, there's a conflict between science and faith. And I I never felt it really was a conflict. <laughs> and I thought, well, someday I'm going to put my thoughts down on paper. But it happened, in a sense, by accident. Or divine providence, one or the other. <laughs> Both. Well, this is a bit risky of me to ask, because I think uh, it will be a challenge for me to uh, understand. But uh, could you could you speak a little bit about your, your work in physics and um, maybe particularly, you know, this business of grand unification, what that means and right. Or so, anything, something else. Sure. So, so the field of physics, I mean, is called particle physics and uh, physicists are divided and many scientists are divided into theorists and experimentalists. So I'm a theory guy, a theoretical particle physicist. Now particle physics um, is, is the branch of physics, which is trying to understand what, find out what are the fundamental constituents of matter uh, up until this point, we've thought they were particles, like electrons and things. Right. right. What are the fundamental forces by which they interact with each other? And what are the fundamental laws of nature that govern all of them, the fundamental laws of physics? So that's what the particle physics is about. Um, my f- research, well, I, I worked on a lot of areas within particle physics. Grand unification uh, is uh, an idea that actually goes back to the, to the early 70s. Uh, it's 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 the attempt uh, to find a unified mathematical theory of the three non gravitational forces. There are four forces of nature that we know of. Five, if you count the Higgs force as a force. Uh, but there's gravity, and which is quite different from the others in some respects. And then there are three other forces. One of which is electromagnetism. Then there's something called the weak force and something called the strong force. And so grand unification. The, the, uh, those three non-gravitational forces actually fit together mathematically in a very elegant way. And um, there are beautiful mathematical uh, models that unify them all. Uh, they, they haven't been proven to be correct in spite of, after 40 something years, but there's overwhelming circumstantial evidence that there's some truth to the grand, the grand unification idea. So I've done a lot of work on that. Probably a third or my papers are probably on that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but I also work on, on things. Uh, one of the big unsolved problems is why do the various particles have the masses that they do? And I've done a lot of work on that. Uh, I've done work on the early universe. Most people in my field also discuss uh, ideas about what happened in the early universe. Like dark, how did, what about dark matter? What about, what is the origin of matter? What is the, or, uh, what is dark matter and how did it originate? Things like that. So you must be uh, interested in the recent launch of the James Webb um, telescope. Oh, yeah. Right. So, so I worked on a whole lot of things. And um, baryogenesis actually is the, is the uh, study of how the universe has got a lot of matter in it, but very little antimatter, which is a bit surprising because at the fundamental level, they're kind of almost mirror images of each other. And the question of how did we end up with a lot of matter and almost no antimatter as the subject of baryogenesis, the genesis of matter. That's what that really is okay. referring to. Okay. Okay. So I've done a lot of work on that, but many other things as well. Great, great. And it, are these the sort of things that uh, you would tend to bring bring home to family discussions? Did you speak around the dinner table about your science? Not, not really. Interested? No, no um, not really. My, it's kind of funny. Uh, my three brothers, none of them went into science and uh, my five children, none of them went into science. So uh, I'm an oddball, I guess. I, my kids tell me, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. But <laughs> do. <laughs> Well, that's the funny thing. I didn't know how to advise my, my kids when they were younger uh, because I, the odd thing is there was never a moment in my life not a single second in which I asked myself what I would do when I grew up. I always knew from the time I was a little toddler, I think, mm. not a little toddler, but when I was little, that I was going to be a scientist and doing something mathematical. Mm. I don't ever, I don't think I consciously ever said I'm going into physics. It was just obvious that I was going to go into mm. physics. <laughs> 
Well, I, I like to ask as, as well uh, what people do outside of their research and their academic life. Um, sometimes, uh, I don't know, movies, Netflix, a series, well, I, I, uh, hobbies, I, sports, travels. Well, my big hobby, and uh, I, which I've wasted endless time, is, is chess. Um, oh, great. Okay. I was able to keep that addiction under control for decades uh, because it was always hard to find someone to play chess with, an actual person. But now that it's on the internet, you can play any time of the day or night. Yes, yes. I had to break that addiction. One year I got very addicted to internet chess and I, bro I, I, I quit it for Lent and, and remained, and remained uh, free of internet chess playing. But there's, I still watch YouTube videos. There's a lot of interesting video chess videos that I watch, but I don't play much. I have a, one of my kids is, is a chess player and one of a former, a former guest on this uh, YouTube channel, uh, Professor Amran Al-Bedoui is uh -huh. a fierce chess player as well. He's a coach and I know his sons play as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's a whole nother culture, chess playing, <laughs> study classic games, right. In theory. And right now it's become a big thing. You know, when I was a kid, no, it, nobody until Bobby Fisher came along. And then that the, now there's uh world chess champion matches and other matches that you can, uh, and, and tournaments that you can watch on YouTube live. You can right, watch the game right. it's kind of- It's gonna be in the Olympics. Exciting. It's gonna be in the Olympics. I told, I tell my kids, it's gotta be an Olympic sport. Why not? Why not an intellectual game in the Olympics? Well, why don't we move towards, um, you know, the topic at hand, which is thinking about um, science and religion, but especially in light of this, the theme of this channel, um, the principle, um, uh, elements of biblical and Quranic faith and, you know, how they can be put in conversation with science and um, not just science classically, but, you know, contemporary scientific research and theories and things like that. Now, in I, I think both in modern physics and ancient faith and in the believing scientists, you mm -hmm. use the phrase, a story of science. It's right. definitely in the latter book. I, I think I remember seeing in the former. Mm -hmm. in, in any case, yeah. Could you introduce us to that phrase, what you mean by the story of science? What I meant by that is, is that the history of science has is, is been told with a certain, well, there's a narrative, as people say nowadays, uh, a, a certain slant. And that is that, that what characterizes the history of science is a series of breakthroughs, each of which somehow uh, made our picture of the world more and more depart from the traditional religious view. Right, right. So I, I talk about two different pictures, the religious picture and then the picture that science seemed to be drawing. And there are many, and so, you know, one of, I grew up with this narrative. I think a lot of people are socialized who go into science, learn this history. You know, so it started with Copernicus and it, it, suddenly we're not the center of, of, of the universe and we've been marginalized. Uh, the earth is not the center, whereas religion supposedly said we are at the center. And then we, you know, the size of the universe turned out to be vastly bigger than people had expected. So we're actually tiny and the universe is, we're, we're dwarfed, we're insignificant. We're the insignificant speck in this vast empty universe. So, you know, that makes it seem insignificant. Uh, and, and every breakthrough, so Newt Newtonian physics back, you know, 200 and something years ago, seem to uh, call into question free will because it, it seemed to say class, what's called classical physics, uh, which prevailed up until the early 20th century, uh, seem to be telling us that the laws of physics were very rigid and that everything that happens in the world is uniquely determined by what happened in the past. And so there's no room for human freedom. Right, right. And so one thing after another, and then Darwin so forth, and, and so on seemed to say that we're, maybe we're just nothing different. We're not really any different fundamentally from animal, lower animals. And, uh, and so it seemed that every breakthrough was, was uh, sort of over, um, undercutting traditional Christ, uh, religious view of the world. And that narrative, the, my whole book, Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, the, the main thrust of it is that that narrative is really outdated and that... Uh, in the 20th, most, uh, there were many big breakthroughs and well, a number of big breakthroughs in the 20th century that actually make the, the story go back the other way. Uh, many, there, there had been, a, seemed to be a sort of a moral to the history of science. And, and now there are what I call plot twists. And suddenly we find out that some of the things we thought science was telling us, it's now telling us something quite different. 
Uh, and so the, it's bringing our picture, the scientific picture of the world, I'm saying, closer uh, to the traditional religious and, and it seems that people generally are not aware of the plot twist. And that, that's what makes your, your work so valuable. Yeah, and I, none of, almost nothing in my book, Monophysics and Ancient Faith, is that original. I mean, there are some original touches, but, but most of the points I'm making are, are, are not my points. Uh, but you're right. They, they've been underplayed or underappreciated, I think, partly out of ignorance and partly because it doesn't fit the narrative you know, that people had. And so they tend to ignore these points or downplay them. Uh, but there, isn't there... Um maybe some blame to be placed also on the culture or the way of speaking among some religious people where uh, there's a certain value placed on things that science has not explained yet as uh, those are the places that are proofs or signs of God's intervention or working or something. Correct. And that actually is a fundamental blunder and it's not really traditional. Um, So, you know, a lot of people, as you say, a lot of people think the place to look for God, evidence of God, is either in the miraculous, and of course, as, as, as a Catholic, I believe in, in, in both the possibility and the actuality of miracles, but that's not traditional, or, or in things that science cannot explain. It's God or nature. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a competition. God is in competition with nature. So what you have a natural explanation for, you don't need God. If you, and if God is explaining something, that means it's supernatural. And that's not the traditional Christian view. Um, if you go back to early Christian writings and you go back to the Bible, uh, you find in early Christian writings that when they're arguing for the existence of God with their pagan contemporaries, they point not to the miraculous, they point to nature itself and its lawfulness. They point not to things that depart from the lawfulness of the order of nature. They point to nature as, as God's handiwork, and they point to the fact that nature is orderly and lawful. And uh, that's, miracles never were an, a, a way of proving that God exists. You know, when Jesus really performed his miracles, he did them in the sight of devout Jews who already believed in God. That's a really interesting God. point, yes. Uh, they were uh, miracles. The, the purpose of miracles is, well, first of all, there's what the Bible calls signs or wonders, are displays of divine power that show, well, God's concern to save, uh, but it also shows that some person or a group is acting by divine, the divine uh, mandate or speaking for God. So uh, uh, a miracle is a sign that somebody is, is a, a, represent, a representative of God. Uh, right, to evidentiary God's proof. Authority. Yeah, but it's not yeah, to prove Islam there is, is very a similar. God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not to prove there is a God. It's right. nature. Nature itself, point, every, every, God is the creator of all things. The things that happen nat- by, by, according to natural laws and and the things that depart from the, the order of nature, but all of them are God's created uh, work, and therefore all of them point to God. And uh, so, yeah, that's a fundamental blunder. Is right. uh, very interesting very to interesting. pit nature and God against each other like that. Well, I think the next point is is related because um, in the believing scientist, you speak about the biblical vision of nature as. Well, it's, it's a bit um, subtle because you, you, you recognize there's a place for the supernatural, but also that it's heavily natural. Maybe that's not the right way to put it. Yeah. But I mean, you, you, almost, you almost speak of the Bible as demythologizing the world. Yes. Because uh, instead of um, calling for the worship of natural things, it almost places them uh, intentionally um, as subjects to, to God or um, signs of God's all pointing to God's uh, either prov- providence or greatness. Or... Right. So the, the, the crucial demythologizing, uh, well, it partly was done by the ancient Greek philosophers, but also to a large extent by the Bible. Um, so in ancient pagan religions with which the ancient Israelites and the early Christians were, were dealing uh, the, the pagan religions of Greece and Babylon and, and, uh, and Rome and, and Egypt and so forth. Uh, 
the world was suffused with with supernatural forces the universe there were there were gods and goddesses of everything you know of the sun and the moon and and the uh, of sex fertility of, of the ocean and forests and so forth and and so the world was filled with gods and 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 so goddesses and the monotheism of 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 the bible uh, stripped the world, the universe, the physical universe stripped it of divinity. Uh, so, and, and a good example of this, and, and so the, the big sin, the greatest sin was idolatry, which was to, to, God was outside the cosmos, outside the universe. He was not a part of it. And so um, <clears throat> uh, a good example of the stripping of the physical universe of divinity is, is in, in, in um, the book of Genesis. So the book of Genesis and the scientific people think of that as, oh, that's a kind of superstitious kind of uh, uh, trying to explain natural phenomena. The the best example of myth. Best example of of mythologizing. But it was quite the opposite. So when when Genesis said the the sun and moon are lamps placed in or or lights placed in the heavens um, to, to, to light the day and the night, that wasn't intended as an alternative to modern astrophysics explanations of the origin of the sun and moon. Those explanations didn't exist yet. They could hardly be a reaction to them. It was a reaction to the pagan religions, which said that the sun and moon were gods. And it's saying, no, they're not gods. They are merely lights. They're, they're, that's all they are. They're lights placed in the heavens by God. So they're like a, a work of cosmic engineering, but they're, they're right. dead. They're inanimate. And you, you think, shared with me, uh, sorry to, to cut you off there. Yeah, no, that's fine. Cut me oh, off. I, just, I it, tend it, to babble on. So, uh. No, 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 it's not, <laughs> it's not at all uh, uh, babbling. It's, re- it's really fascinating. And it just can, it made me think of a passage that you had shared with, with me in our earlier correspondence from the Book of Wisdom. And I, I just want to read a, a little bit here because here sort of very explicitly, there's the play between um, the things of the world as subject to God, uh, but also the, the polemic against those who would make them more than that, right? So wisdom chapter 13, verse one reads, for all people who are ignorant of God were foolish by nature and they were unable from the good things that are seen to know the one who exists, nor did they recognize the artisan, while playing heed to his works. Uh, And just a little bit more, so verse two, but they suppose that either fire or wind or swift air or the circle of the stars or turbulent water or the luminaries of heaven were the gods that rule the world. So, yeah. Right. And it goes on to say uh, that if if people are impressed by the power and working of these things, let them know how much more powerful is the one who created them. And if they're impressed by their beauty, uh, let the, they should be more impressed by the the one the author of beauty the, by the and and then um, it ends it, that part ends with uh, the statement which is sort of a very philosophical statement uh, for the um, the greatness and beauty of created things give um, maybe you have it there uh, uh, by from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a perception of their creator exactly for for from the greatness and beauty of created things exactly as you said this is verse five comes a corresponding perception of their creator and right and so there the thing and, and as as the list of things you read you know uh fire and water and swift air and the circle of the stars and all the things that that passage points to are natural those aren't miracles. Those are natural yes, phenomena. Yes, yes. And it says, from the greatness and beauty of the created world, of created things, it, their natural things, comes a perception of their creator. And that was the traditional argument. It was mm-hmm. the created, the natural world is reflecting God. Um, and St. Paul takes that up in, in, in the first uh, chapter of the letter to the Romans. Uh, and that is the basis. And you see this theme echoed repeat echoed endlessly by early Christian writers pointing to the order and they they emphasized um, two things about the world pointing to God about the physical world as pointing to God one is that the universe exists and they say there must be a, a, a source or a, 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 a cause of being <laughs> and the other is that the world is orderly and the word order 
these four words are used over and over by early Christian writers, order, harmony, lawfulness, beauty. Beauty. Hmm. Especially order. They, they keep coming back to order. And, and one of the early Christian writers says, there, God is the, the, is the father, the creator, the author, the giver of order. And, and many of them say the same thing. So the orderliness of the world is pointing to a giver of order, uh, a, a mind, <laughs> a lawgiver. So, uh, but it's all rooted in, in the Bible. These are themes that I think are very close to the Quran itself. Mm -hmm. Quran speaks of the elements of the natural world as signs. The Arabic word is ayat. Uh, and they are therefore put together with the signs of revelation. So particular verses of the Quran are also called ayat. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, both are passed to the knowledge of God. Now, the, the history of Muslim reflection on science is a complicated one. And for another episode, um, but there, there, there are um, uh, uh, conflicts between Muslim theologians, um, particularly in a school known as Ashari school, who develop a notion of God recreating um, all, all things at every instant. So a sort of atomistic approach um, to the natural world. And that, that sort of is, that's challenged by many Muslim philosophers. And, that, and that's called, I guess, occasionalism. Exactly, exactly. Theologians, right. Yeah. So, well, uh, let's let's speak a little bit about um, places where people might think there's a conflict between religion and science. And I wanted to start with um, evolution. Mm -hmm. um, I think you write in the Believing Scientists that maybe evolution, and I think the story is actually more complicated than it may seem because. You know, in 1950, Pope Pius XII published Humani Generis, and we can speak about that maybe a, a little bit. But um, maybe evolution is the one case where the church has been in conflict with, uh, with science and has had to think through its teaching um, on evolution. Uh, yeah, how would, you, how would you put it? Well, I wouldn't put it that way. I think what happened, the one place where the church was actually in conflict with science, I think really the only time was the Galileo affair. Okay. But I think church authorities learned something from that affair, and they took a very hands-off approach to evolution, probably partly because of they got their fingers burned in a Galileo case. So it, or Darwin's Origin of Species uh, was published in 1859, and it wasn't the first time the, uh, magister the universal magisterium of the church, the Pope, or any, uh, talked about evolution was 1950s. That's almost okay. a century later. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, so that humani generis of Pope Pius XII, that's basically, that's, that's the, the first, first statement. That's the first sort of mm -hmm. official statement mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. universal church on evolution. They took a, as I said, hands-off attitude to some extent. Now, I should say, people, when, when people, I think, one thing I think people don't realize is that there, there is, always the possibility of tension between science and theology, but there's also always not just the possibility, but the reality of tension within science and within theology. I mean, uh, maybe people nowadays are used to getting quick answers to everything, but the fact is when you have difficult questions, they have to be wrestled with. And often, let's take within science. Within science, you often have two things that there's a lot of evidence for that don't seem to sit very comfortably with each other. Uh, and it often takes scientists decades to, to work through and, and the issues and to, to see how things fit together properly. And we can give many examples of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe the, so that, the, that the universe has an origin in time. Well, no, I'm thinking, think, take a, a, a very important example. Uh, so there's very powerful evidence. There's always been very powerful evidence that the quantum mechanics is correct and very powerful evidence for Einstein's theory of gravity. And yet uh, it's been a problem since the mid, actually 20th century, uh, uh, since the 1930s, really, that those two things seem to be impossible to, rec yes. to bring together yes. in, a, in a mathematically consistent way. Yes. But scientists you know, have wrestled with that. Now, there's at least one way known of harmonizing or having, a, there's one known theory that gives you both in a consistent mathematical way. 
Uh, but 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 scientists live with that. Tend- At any given time, there are experiments that seem to conflict with other experiments or experiments that are, seem to be solid, but don't sit very well with, with well-established theories. It's that's what drives science forward is trying to uh, work out these apparent contradictions or anomalies and so on. Okay. The same within theology. So there are a lot of the history of the early church, you know, well, Jesus was a man, and yet Christ is God. Jesus is God. How they see, that seems it could be a contradiction. How does that work? Mm-hmm. You know, we have free will, and yet God knows the future. So there are many things that, that are puzzles and paradoxes, and it mm-hmm. takes time to sort them out. And the same thing with science and theology is that when a new scientific idea comes along, it takes time to see how that fits together with, with what we believe on religious grounds. And that's not that's as it should be. That's as it should be, um, because that's the way. <laughs> that's the way we advance and understand it. Mm-hmm. But but there was uh, there was with the Catholic Church, the idea of evolution itself of plants and animals or even natural selection that was never really an issue, the or not it was a minor issue. But the real question raised by evolution for the Catholic Church had to do the origin of man and our nature. So, um, and that is a profound question. Uh, what does evolution imply? Are we just animals? Um, uh, do we have spiritual souls and so on? Uh, and so how do we differ from animals if, if we do? There are profound questions raised by evolution mm-hmm. and, and it takes time for theologians, philosophers, to, to, to figure these out. So can, can we speak a little bit about the nuts and bolts of, of thinking through evolution in light of faith? Yeah. Um, you know, of course, there are people out there who are young earth creationists and completely deny um, evolution. Um, but those who are convinced uh, by the scientific data, um, uh, there's the problem of the um, origin of the the human soul, but there's also the problem of, and I think the term is polygenesis versus oh, yeah. so the, monogenesis. That's, that's could could you explain issue. those two? And yeah, right. So those uh, the, for the Catholic Church, the, the issues that young Earth creationists are worried about. See, the Catholic Church has never been committed to a narrowly, I'll say, literalistic view of how to interpret the Bible. I mean, even Saint Augustine, if you read in the you know, in his uh, in the fourth or uh, uh, fifth century. Mm-hmm. He's writing about the book of Genesis in a, in, in a treatise called on the, on the Literal Meaning of Genesis. Uh, but the way he read Genesis is nothing like what a modern biblical literal. Je- Augustine's view, uh, reading of Genesis was extremely symbolic and, uh, and, and uh, sophisticated. So, so, and not at all literalistic. But uh, anyway, uh, the, the two questions you mentioned are the ones that are the critical ones. Uh, for the church. One is the human soul. And so the, the position the church more or less had from the beginning and, seven, and is now is the prevailing view uh, is that the, the, what, what, Saint, what um, John Paul II, St. John Paul II called the essential point, uh, which had also been the, the point uh, made by Pope Pius XII in 1950, is the, the, the human body or the human being at the physical level at the level of physics and chemistry and biology uh, ha- may have a, a, a evolutionary origin, but we have something that goes beyond physics and chemistry and biology, and that's a spiritual dimension to us, what's traditionally called a spiritual soul. And that is not just the product of physics and chemistry and biology, that is in a certain sense directly uh, conferred by God, mm-hmm. not just with the first humans, but with every human being who comes into the world, mm. every baby that's born is not just the product of the sperm and the egg and the, of the physics and chemistry that's going on there. Right. The spiritual dimension, and, and this is symbolized in scripture, uh, and this goes, but the church fathers and the early church writers saw Genesis 2-7, where God breathes upon Adam and he becomes... Oh, well, some translations say he becomes a living soul, uh, that that symbolizes that f- physically we're taken from the earth. 
we're made of the same stuff as everything else. Interesting. But spiritually, yeah. we come yeah. from above. As the infusion like God, of the soul. Right? God, yes, God conferring on us uh, spiritual attributes, such as, in particular, reason mm-hmm. and free will. So uh, that, that's the crucial point. But the other point, as you said, is what's called the question of monogenism versus polygenism. Uh, there, are, there are powerful theological reasons to want to stay with the idea that the human race began with two individuals, which is about whom the Bible calls Adam and Eve. Even if it was a couple million years ago. and not- you know, it doesn't matter. The time, how far in the past it was, doesn't matter. <laughs> but there are certain theological reasons why why uh, you don't want to be too quick in abandoning the idea of two original humans, whereas science <clears throat> has there very powerful arguments, uh, especially nowadays based on genetics, right, right. that the first human beings uh, arose in the population of at least several thousand interbreeding uh, population yeah. of several yeah. thousand. Uh, you, and, and so how does that work? Uh, <clears throat> Well, the church, Pius XII was very careful on that. Yeah, he, 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 he didn't say that polygenics and the idea there were many original humans. Mm-hmm. He didn't say that that was absolutely forbidden. And Adam, he said, Catholics are not free to embrace it, he said. And then he said, and this is a direct quote, because it is in no way apparent how it can be reconciled with teachings on original sin and so forth. He didn't say it couldn't be reconciled. He said it is in no way apparent, and therefore we can't, embr- not that we must reject it forever, but we cannot embrace it. So he didn't close the door, and this is generally understood. <clears throat> he left the door open there a little bit. Interesting. Um, and so that's still not a completely settled question theologically. Okay, okay. Can, can we <laughs> circle back? I, I wasn't <laughs> thinking of doing this, but you know, I've had conversations with both Muslims and Christians uh, in which Galileo has come up as sort of the um, the classic case of the church's backwardness. Um, I think you write that, um, you know, the church was, was wrong about uh, the condemnation, but that what was at stake wasn't a supernatural explanation and a natural explanation, but actually two natural explanations, one which was happened to be better. <laughs> but it, it did, yeah, is that right? Is that how you put it? Yeah. So what was that was an example. That was the, a great blunder in the history of the church. But it's a very complicated affair. It could take like five hours to talk about it and scratch the surface of it. But it's important. It wasn't that the church was advocating authorities were insisting upon a supernatural explanation of the solar system versus a scientific one. They were advocating an old scientific <laughs> The existing prevailing scientific view, which, which was not invented by Christians. In fact, it, it, it goes against the, the literal interpretation of Genesis in the Bible. In the Bible, the earth is a flat disk and there's a dome called the firmament. And so firmament. It's, mm-hmm. But the scientific view that had prevailed for over 1500 years, which went back to the pagan Greeks, was of the earth in the of spheres, concentric spheres, with the earth being a sphere in the middle, and then these planets and the sun, and the sun going around the earth, and so on. That was uh, that that was Ptolemy and, and Aristotle. So the church was uh, st- trying to stick with an older scientific view, because that older scientific view harmonized for a number of reasons. Partly because it it harmonized well with Aristotelian philosophy and Aristotelian philosophy had become entwined very much with Catholic theology and partly because there are certain verses in scripture which read very literalistically uh, would suggest that the earth doesn't move. Uh, But, you know, looking back in hindsight, you can see that's obviously not what those scriptural verses are intended to convey. When when it says, you know, God has established the earth firm and not to be moved, it's celebrating the fact that we all appreciate, those of us who don't live in places with a lot of earthquakes, (laughs) that we live on a pretty solid, firm planet, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, that's a blessing, actually. that uh, we don't live on the sea being tossed around and we don't live in places. The Quran says something similar about the, it, the, it, earth, the mountains themselves sort of uh, making the earth firm. Yeah, the earth is firm and that's a good thing. And it is firm. I mean, as 
it, it's unless there's a big earthquake, uh, you know, it's firm. It's not talking about astronomy at that point. It's not talking about whether how the relative motion of the Earth and the Sun and the stars and so on. But uh, yeah, so for various reasons, uh, and it's a complicated story. But another thing is, you know, they they weren't rejecting science. I think it's more fair to say they didn't understand the boundaries between science and theology and philosophy mm -hmm. as, as they should have. Because remember, science was a very new thing at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, Galileo is often called the father of modern science, and that would be, a des would be deserved because um, really the scientific revolution, which created modern science, happened right at that time. And he was one of the fathers, and mm -hmm. maybe the most important of Kepler, Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo, mm -hmm. they were creating modern science. And the church didn't really fully understand what they were dealing with and uh, somewhat naively rushed in to, to make judgment. Then there's other factors too, historical factors. You know, it was the middle of, it was a raging competition between the Catholics and the Protestants because it had just been the Protestant Reformation and, and how to interpret the Bible was a big bone of contention between Catholics and Protestants. Uh, and so the church actually was very sensitive about people coming along and giving interpretations of passages that were sort of novel, mm -hmm. pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the Protestant, Protestantism was based, the Protestants had been interpreting Bible passages in, in novel ways. And yes. Uh, yes. so it's a very tangled affair, but it mm -hmm. wasn't an attack. It wasn't, a, the church didn't see itself as rejecting science. It, it, in fact, it valued uh the, the, the leading astronomers of that time were many of them were Jesuit priests and the, and the church authorities consulted the leading astronomers about the church. Yes. And, yeah. and they respected science. They, but for a lot of, it was a, what do they say? A perfect storm <laughs> of, of things that happened and contributed to this, this fiasco. And if any one of them had happened a bit differently, uh, we wouldn't be talking about this. Right, right. Well, this is actually a good uh, segue, Steve, because I, I'd like to speak a little bit about uh, the Big Bang, expansion of the universe, origin of time, and th those sort of yeah. questions. Good. So another sort of uh, cosmic dimension sort of uh, uh, affair. Um, and here is something is sort of uh, uh, moves in the opposite direction with the Galileo affair, because he, here people would say, oh, um, uh, here, science has sort of vindicate, vindicated uh, the, the biblical view or the Quranic view. Um, the Quran also speaks about God as creator of the heavens and the earth. Um, and uh, while there were also Muslim philosophers, um, and uh, I know I've written about Thomas Aquinas on this, this question, but there were Muslim philosophers who said their arguments both for and against the possibility that um, the, uh, the cosmos existed eternally back going back posteriorly um but anyway uh you know it's, it's still um christians and muslims celebrate the discovery of the big bang as sort of proof that they're, they're right about things um and in fact i think in terms of the way that the science at the time unfolded there were uh there was a, a catholic priest georges lemaitre right. who was at least on the theoretical side not the observational side because i think it was hubble and others who actually observed the expansion of the universe but who are instrumental in coming up with the idea and convincing the scientific community. Maybe it took some time, but mm -hmm. um, yes, anyway, it, so it, took, it took time. It did take time. It, it, yeah. It time. So it maybe time. could you speak about generally this idea sure. that the Big Bang sort of um, vindicates a biblical or Quranic view <clears throat> of the cosmos? Okay. So first of all, I would I would strongly emphasize that one should make a distinction between the fact that the world is created, that is, it, it depends for its existence on a source of being, a cause of being, which is God, who is God, and the fact that it has a finite age, a temporal starting point, uh, that they, they are tied together in many people's minds. And, and, uh, and, and, and the first words of the Bible say, in the beginning, God created. So beginning and created are linked in, in some ways, but they're distinct ideas. Beginning is just saying the, the universe had a, um, a finite age, a, a temporal beginning. And the creation is the universe's ontological dependence on God. It, it okay, exists. that's really important. And it's a subtle that's distinction. Important. That's not easy to grasp. Right. And, and uh, many theologians, I think, in Christian and Muslim and uh, many philosophers, uh, 
um, argue that uh, if the world is created, it must have a finite age. And if it has a finite age, it must be created. And they think that those logically entail each other. Thomas Aquinas didn't agree. He thought that you could prove that the universe was created, but you couldn't prove philosophically that it had a finite age. He thought that God could have chosen, it could have had the power and could have created a universe that had infinite age. It was, had no beginning and no end in time, uh, but had chosen to, not to do it that way. But anyway, but yeah, so but nevertheless, uh, the Christianity teaches Can both. I jump in there for a second, yeah. just to get Thomas's opinion straight? Yeah. So it, I think you basically got, got there. But it, so he argued that God could have created the universe in a way that it stretched back infinitely in time. Yes. Uh, but he chose not to. And the way we know he chose not to is revelation. Is, is revelation. Is scripture, basically. Is exactly. Okay. Right. And now... Uh, but the church has always taught both that there is uh, God, the world is created, and also that the world is a finite age. It doesn't, the church doesn't teach, it never taught that the particular age, but it had a beginning. And that I think it has generally been regarded as uh, a part of the faith of the church that the universe had a temporal beginning. And there, I think one could say that the discoveries of modern science have vindicated that. They haven't proven creation. They've proven, and they proven, and they haven't actually proven the universe had a beginning. But the weight of evidence is now strongly in favor of the universe having a finite age. Uh, and so, yeah, I think we could chalk that one up as a uh, a win <laughs> for biblical and I guess Quranic religion. Um, <clears throat> uh, and yes, uh, because that idea was actually was. Um, in modern times, until the Big Bang theory came along, scientists were more and more uh, gravitating, no pun intended, to the idea that the universe had an infinite age. And you find statements by, by eminent scientists around 100 years ago, or, or more than 100 years ago, saying that, that it's part, you know, science has shown that the universe has a finite age. And I mean, has, 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 has always been around as infinite, uh, past infinite. Uh, and so, yes, it was quite a shocking thing to many scientists when it turned out or it seems to have turned out that the universe had a beginning. And, and the main, the prime mover there really was, uh, in coming up with the Big Bang Theory, was Georges Lemaitre, who's this Belgian theoretical physicist and uh, Catholic priest. Uh, it's true that the observations were done by Hubble, some of them, but Hubble himself did not interpret his observations as meaning that the universe was expanding. Oh. That interpretation was also a Georges Lemaitre. He, oh. Georges Lemaitre, who not only pointed out, one of the people who pointed out that Einstein's theory of gravity could imply, could give you as one of the solutions to the equations an expanding universe, but he also interpreted the results of Hubble and others as evidence that the universe is in fact expanding. And, uh, and it, that idea ran into some resistance for a while, but in the 1960s, more or less people came around to uh, realizing that, that there was a beginning, which Lemaitre had called um, the primeval atom. He said, right. not the started, Big Bang, but- yes. He didn't call it the Big Bang, he called it the primeval atom and, and, and that there was this explosion and, and so forth and so on. The Big Bang sounds like some American came up with that. Well, yes, it. actually, I don't I'm know- Just who, guessing. I, no, it was, but it was, I'm told, I think it might, might have been Fred Hoyle, I'm not sure, but some scientists uh, okay. referred to it in, in, as a pejorative is to mock the idea. Oh, okay. So actually, the, word, the term Big Bang, I am told, was originally used as a kind of way of mocking the idea, but it yes. stuck. It, it stuck as the term. <laughs> yes. Well, there's, there's so much to speak about, and there's, there's not enough time. I, I wanted to get one or two more questions maybe in okay. about this. One is I babble too much. <laughs> no, no, you, you don't. It's, you just raise so many interesting dimensions and are able to speak about the theology and the science. Um, yeah, so uh, Hubble, and uh, uh, as interpreted by Georges Lemaitre and then right. many other um, uh, um, physicists working on the cosmos, right. uh, see that the, the universe is expanding. And I think it has to do with the, the light, in part, the light of distant stars and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, just on a science, scientific question, I, I think there's a debate about whether the universe will continue to expand infinitely and grow cold or whether it will begin to contract and there'll be something like the big crunch. Right. And that's connected to, I think, a theory called the bouncing universe that you speak about. 
Well, so, uh, if the universe is going to collapse to a big crunch, then it raises the possibility that it might uh, bounce and start a, another cycle or something. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. mm -hmm. Is is there uh, is there a consensus about whether it will continue to expand or that process will reverse among um, theoretical? Well, um, the evidence until 1998, there was no way. It, it seemed like it was a 50-50 proposition because the the the, the uh, there are basically two solutions to Einstein's equations: one which was uh, where it ex expands forever, and one where it it expands, reaches a maximum, and then collapses to what people call the big crunch. Uh, because until 1998, it looked like the universe's expansion was slowing down. And it was only a question of whether it would slow down, whether it was slowing at such a rate that it would eventually be reverse, become a contraction, or whether it was slowing down, but would always Mm -hmm. going on, but slower and slower, yes. but always expanding. Yes. But in 1998, it was discovered that the universe, while it had been expanding, but the expansion had been slowing for billions of years, that several billion years ago, the expansion started to speed up. And so we now believe that the universe is expanding at an ever accelerating rate. And if that's the case, then it's not going to recollapse. I mean, if that continues, yes. We're not going to recollapse. So I'd say the the it seems like uh, the evidence sort of tilts now towards the universe expanding forever, but you can't really say because there's always things, new discoveries being made. Right, right. Okay, okay. And then the other bit I wanted to make sure we touch on before we finish, and we just have a couple minutes left, um, okay. is to, to speak about um, as a commonly heard objection to a monotheist Jew, Christian, or Muslim who says, Oh, the Big Bang sort of indicates, or at least seems to correspond with the biblical Quranic view um, of the universe. Um, you, you hear commonly, well, why couldn't there have been something before the Big Bang? Um, I think that's related to the idea of a multiverse, which is popular now thanks to Spider Man. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the latest. Well, I movie. mean, you see. Um, yeah, I, I now the thing is, there might have been something before the Big Bang. There's no evidence of that, and there's no that's a pure speculation at this point, and there's no theoretical or experimental reason to think that, that there was anything before the Big Bang. That's pure speculation. Uh, but even if there was something before the Big Bang, uh, there are relatively strong arguments, theoretical arguments, that the universe must have had, probably had a beginning at some point. It could have been an earlier point. Maybe the Big Bang wasn't the beginning, but there are strong arguments that the universe probably did have a beginning, and whether at the Big Bang or some earlier point. But I think that's, in a, uh, I don't know if there's enough time, but the, I think that's in the way taking the, one's eye off the ball. Uh, I would like to give a people an analogy. Mm -hmm. There's a distinction, but take something like a novel or a piece of music. There's a distinction between the beginning of the work and the origin of the work. So the beginning of a novel is the first words of the novel. Okay. The beginning of the symphony of the first notes. That's quite different from why is there a novel? Hmm. It's not the first words. They don't explain why there is a novel. The, the author explains. The novelist is the explanation. Mm -hmm. Why is there a symphony? It, the first notes do not explain that. It is the composer who explains that. So the, worrying about the what happened at the beginning of the universe is not really theologically interesting. That's really it's not things happened at the beginning. Yes. The question of creation is why is there a universe? Why is there a universe at all? Mm -hmm. And because God exists outside of time or the time space continuum, right. uh, that's not a question of when things began, it's right. a question of, of origin <clears throat> or relationship. I used the, the fancy word ontological between God and the cosmos. Correct. And God, you know, in an old analogy used again by early Christian writers, is that God is like the author of the, of the book. Um, in fact, this, you mentioned this earlier, Galilee, the idea that the, the revelation comes in the form of, of verses of revealed text and also nature. It, I think it was St. Augustine, maybe first, I'm not sure, St. Augustine, who's had talked about the book of, of the gospel, the book of uh, scripture, the book uh, uh, and the book of nature mm. as two books, right. both of whom had God as the author of them. 
but but God, uh, in a way, thought up the universe. <laughs> Uh, people, unfortunately, as we're time-bound creatures, we tend to think of everything as a process. And we think, some people think of God as a, like a tinkerer in a workshop, you know, but they're just making him another time-bound entity, yes. Yes. putting him on the same plane. The creation of the universe was not a physical process that happened in a workshop uh, by a series of, no, it was a timeless, eternal act of will on God's part, where he willed that there would be a universe and it would have these characteristics, and he, he might say, thought up the universe. And much more like a composer <clears throat> thinks up the symphony. Yes. You know, the creation happens in the mind of the composer, yes. Yes. and the creation of the world happens in the mind of God. And what the, the details of what happened, and he creates, just as the composer writes every note of the symphony, not just the ones at the beginning, but all the notes. And so God writes all of, of the events and things that are in the universe, the things at the beginning, but also things right now. So this pen has being, it exists, it's real. It's not a fictitious or hypothetical pen uh, or possible pen. It's an actual existing pen. Mm -hmm. And it has that being, that ex actual existence, because God is giving it existence right now. This is being held in being by God, as I think it's the book of Hebrews said, God upholds all things by the word of his power. He holds everything in existence. And without that, it would lapse into non-existence. So that's creation. God's creating right. We say in the creed, creator of heaven and earth of all things. Mm. God creates all things. Right now, the things billions of years ago, the things billions of years in the future, mm. all are created by God. And just to, to clarify, maybe one scientific point that uh, your, your books help me understand, I probably should have gotten it long ago. But um, I mean, according to the notion of the Big Bang, um, it's not as though there's an infinite series of moments um, stretching in the past. And at one of those moments, God creates, and that's the Big Bang. Right. But time and space are uh, not organically, but right, right, right. Uh, exactly. necessarily related. So time it's, it's, itself is created. One of the greatest moments in human uh, intellectual history. So the pagans of antiquity would mock the Christians and Jews. Uh, this is before the Islam. They would mock Christians and Jews for saying that God created the world a finite time ago. And they said, what was your God? Because they pagan Greeks, the ancient Greek philosophers, believed that the, uh, that the universe had existed for infinite time. And so they said, what was your God doing for all that infinite time before he only got around to making the world recently? What was he doing for infinite time? And St. Augustine's very profound insight was, you can't ask that question because there's no time before the universe begins. Mm -hmm. The so time begins anticipating when, Einstein when the yeah, right when the universe when when created world begins then time begins because time is an aspect of the created world and so if you if you go and now we say the same thing in physics if say the Big Bang or some other event let's say the Big Bang was the beginning of the universe then it's also the beginning of time so if the beginning of the universe was fourteen point seven or was it fourteen billion years ago let's say. If somebody asks you what was going on 30 billion years ago, that's a meaningless question mm -hmm. because time stops 14 billion years ago. It, there is no such thing as 30 billion years ago. Just like there's no such thing as north of the North Pole. Yes, or, or faster than the speed of north. light. And so, so St. Augustine anticipated that insight 15 centuries ago. He said, do not ask what God was doing then, meaning before the world existed, do not ask what God was doing then. There is no then where there is no time. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's the way we should think of it. Great. Well, that's, that's really <laughs> insightful. Steve, there's so many other questions I wanted to get to. Okay. I wanted to speak about free will, but I think we should probably end it here. Okay. Uh, and maybe this gives me um, a good line to come back with when I invite you on again. Okay. <laughs> that we didn't get to free will. And There's I want to speak actually will, I mean, more about Einstein and his own <laughs> own view of religion and faith. And but let's let's postpone all of that. And yeah, just allow me to thank you so much for for your generosity with your time and wisdom. I Thanks enjoyed it. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the 
um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars. And um, we'll be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos, starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.